Very good morning, everyone, uh, and hello and welcome to part two of the session on sustainability, the next frontier for Indian ERD. We had a very fruitful session yesterday where we had uh, participation from GCC leaders. Today, we have an interesting lineup of speakers uh, from service providers where we will be hearing their perspectives in terms of how Indian service providers and global service providers are contributing to the sustainability journey of their customers. I have with me today, Rajneesh Kini, uh, Chief Technology Officer at uh, Scient, Badrina Jairam, Global Head, TCS, DigiFleet. Uh, I have uh, Ravikant Pasumarthi, uh, Vice President Technology at uh, Capgemini Engineering. And I have Sukant Acharya, who's the Executive Vice President at uh, HCL Tech. So let's uh, begin with a round of introductions from them. Uh, Rajneesh, uh, let's get started with you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm Rajneesh, uh, as Karan mentioned, uh, Chief Technology Officer at Scient. Uh, I joined Scient about two years back, uh, but before that, I have about 25 years of experience in engineering domain. Uh, the last two years have been very exciting with a focus on autonomous systems and sustainability and uh, very eager to talk to you about our sustainable uh, offers and sustainable capabilities as well as some proof points uh, that we have in this area. Thank you, Karan. Thank you, Rajneesh. Over to you, uh, Abhadrinath. Thank you so much, Karan. And, uh, you know, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Badri. Uh, I'm part of uh, Tata Consulting Services. Uh, within that, specifically, uh, roll up into a unit called IoT and Digital Engineering. Uh, my, currently, my current responsibility is, you know, I'm the global head for the product TCS DG fleet, where we are focused on providing predictive, sustainable insights for the assets on the move. Look forward to this discussion and hope, uh, you know, to share some of our experiences. Thank you so much, uh, Madhuri. Uh, Ravikant, uh, over to you. Yeah, hi, Ravikant here. Uh, thanks, everyone. So, uh, working as a Vice President Technology at Capgemini Engineering, uh, my forte has been on the wireless and satellite networks. And as you see, as we get into the sustainable plans and actions, right, as we get into, networks play a very important role. And uh, maybe we'll talk about some perspectives about that, what we do, and how we actually can uh, take up this journey from an Indian R&D perspective uh, in today's session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sukant, uh, uh, your introduction. Thank you so much, Karan. Hi, everybody. This is Sukant Acharya. I'm the Executive Vice President and Global Head of uh, Industry Next IoT and Sustainability Business at HCL Tech. Um, when I say Industry Next and IoT, essentially it focuses on the digital transformation of the asset value chain, be it uh, manufacturing, operations, assets, equipments, smart products, intelligent operations, and so on and so forth. Sustainability, of course, uh, you know, cutting across uh, whether be it uh, the IT infrastructure, be it the sustainable product, sustainable finance, and um, sustainable operations. So we have a cut. Uh, we have a, this business focuses across the value chain of sustainability, if we can put it in that way. And happy to be here. I think it is very timely as COP COP twenty eight just kick started in uh, Dubai, and um, glad that NASCOM has organized this and, uh, and the timing is pretty great. Thank you so much and uh, looking forward to a great discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Sukant, and thank you everybody else for um, your introductions. Um, so looking forward to a very exciting uh, session as we go forward. So let me begin with uh, uh, with Rajneesh and uh, Ravi, uh, maybe first with uh, Rajneesh. What is your view on the opportunity that exists um, in the context of um, sustainability, right? So because uh, as a service provider, you engage with multiple customers, um, you, you're looking at multiple problem statements. So what's what's the scale in your view um, uh, uh, with regard to sustainability? And where is it that you're seeing uh, most traction, both in, th in terms of the sustainability themes as well as uh, across industry verticals? I think you're muted, uh, Rajneesh, uh, if you could unmute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thanks for the question, Karan. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it, it, sustainability is a boardroom topic across the industries. I think we all know that, that it's becoming more and more uh, important for organizations, countries, 
as well as all the, uh, I would say, uh, initiatives that governments are taking, right? So across the board. But uh, some of the industries are probably definitely taking a bigger initiative there because they have a lot to catch up and a lot to make sure they are able to meet the government regulatory requirements in the near future. The number one will definitely be in the oil and gas segment, right? Because they produce a lot of carbon. It could be any uh, uh, generation plants or it could be uh, uh, manufacturing plants, right? So some of those uh, areas where there is a significant impact of carbon footprint being created today, right? So I would put oil and gas. Second is uh, a transportation segment, right? So second will be transportation segment, which includes uh, aero, uh, rail, automotive, uh, shipping, right? So uh, all, all kind of marine and all kind of uh, transportation industry where also there is a significant carbon footprint generation. So that could be a second segment. Uh, now, while these are largely carbon footprint generators, there are uh, other segments which uh, also comes into sustainability, right? Which is more about material reusage, uh, circularity design and those kind of things. When it comes to that segment, it will be probably largely with respect to the equipment manufacturers, right? So OEMs, whether it is a healthcare product manufacturer uh, or any other, right? So uh, equipment manufacturer, they are investing significantly in circularity design, waste management, uh, as well as making sure that the product that they are generating, right, is very uh, sustainable in terms of uh, uh, energy wastage, carbon footprint reduction, all of those areas as well. The, the last two industries I would touch upon is uh, communication and healthcare. They're probably not to the same extent, but in terms of uh, energy utilization, as well as uh, wastage that is being generated in healthcare, right? Those are two industries that are significantly focused on reducing uh, their wastage or energy utilization. In communication, for example, the data centers and the, uh, the radio uh, sources create a lot of energy utilization and th that's a significant area. Data centers is a very big uh, source of uh, uh, carbon footprint as well to some extent, right? So all of that, right? So I think these are three, four segments uh, uh, in each of the areas, right? First one is more on the carbon capture side, which is oil and gas, but the second, uh, when it comes to uh, equipment manufacturing, circularity design, that's the second area. Third is more on energy and wastage management, which could be communication and healthcare. In general, this industry is growing, uh, sustainability as a industry is growing everywhere, uh, anywhere between 10% to 51%. If you take green hydrogen, it is probably growing at 51% based on the reports that I have seen, while some of the other segments are growing anywhere between 10 to 20%. I hope that answers. That that, that, that's interesting, uh, Rajni. So, uh, Ravikant, uh, from your perspective, so you have an industry focus within Capgemini. So, Give us some insights uh, in terms of how you are seeing uh, sustainability uh, being leveraged in the context of your uh, focus areas. Uh, you're on mute again, uh, Ravika. Yes, sorry. Yeah, so so before that, right, I think there are two things which I would highlight, right? So, the, so look at the opportunity, right? It's, it's a huge, right? One part is, uh, if you look at uh, uh, UN has set up a crisis net zero goals, and then there is an initiative as well as SBTI, right? Science-based target initiative, so which is about how to use uh, right, the technology is to be able to meet the net zero goals. Um, similarly, ITUT, if you look at recent also has come up with what is a green action plan. Now you talk about how to use the digital technologies, right, to be able to manage this uh, sustainability. So, so definitely there is a big opportunity of how do you actually start using the technologies across various industry segments, verticals, and use cases. Right, as I mentioned, there are actually multiple. So it, it cut across cut all the industry segments and verticals. Now what happens is each area has a different contribution or actually impact which could be there. But, but in general, right, it, it's spread across you now the manufacturing, mechanical, life sciences, transport, power, etc. In each area, we see that there is an opportunity. Now, each one has a different problem statement to add. But broadly, what we do, what we can say is that we can categorize it, this problem statement into four different uh, groups or areas, right? One is what, what we call as a sustainable products and services, right? And second is a manufacturing design supply chain. Apps, digital apps, right? And the apps and infra, we'll talk about the green infra, et cetera, coming here. And the sustainable 5G networking. So what we see is, right, all the industries can actually be classified into one of these areas. The amount of problem statement what you could solve, right, could vary. For example, in a sustainable products and services, we're talking about actually designing circular products and services, right? That could be one of the focus areas. In the manufacturing, it's actually implementing the circular supply chain. 
So circular economy is a very important aspect. Use of digital technology is a very important aspect. In, in the context of device, apps, and infra, we see using a circular infrastructure, green infrastructure is very, very important, right? How do you take care of this? And fourth is the 5G, and uh, right, it's, it's a very, uh, 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 I would say, a different segment in all itself. The one important data point, what you see is, right, for example, you can compare um, uh, IT, right, or wireless infra operators. It looks like actually the amount of emissions, CO2 emissions, which this industry actually generates is much more than what the airlines actually actually do. And you're talking about actually very high rapid pace of growth happening. And then they contribute, as I'm sure said, by 2030, it actually could contribute 8% of the overall CO2 emissions as well. Because we're talking about actually bringing in multiple technologies. And it all of uses the, uh, what you call the, uh, right, uh, the, the fuel consumption, power energy, and then subsequently leading to emissions. So, so in, in broadly, right, there is an opportunity. There is an opportunity actually to be able to make sure that we use a technology, digital technology-based objectives targets or using the size-based target initiatives, categorize them into all the verticals and industries, and then we could actually start leveraging and uh, defining and address the opportunities. As of the opportunity scale could vary in each sector, but there are different segments, groups, which you need to address, categorize, and then start picking up and building up and uh, address this uh, uh, problem going forward. It's very interesting. Moving on to uh, Sukant. Um, so uh, what do you see as some of the sustainability uh, priorities of your customers? And what are some of the biggest pain points that they're trying to solve? That's a great question, Karan. Um, see, when you, when you talk about priorities, we can look at it from different dimensions. So uh, first is uh, based on the life cycle maturity where the customers are today. So if you look at it, um, you know, essentially reporting and compliance reporting becomes the first priority for them. Uh, though uh, it does not add a tremendous value because if you think about, you know, so by just reporting, you are not able to reduce the carbon footprint. You have to take some actions to reduce carbon footprint. So that's why I call it as based on the maturity life cycle. So this is something which is important, which is uh, because of the flood of all the regulations and the directives and so on and so forth, this is something they need to do. So this is actually pretty prevalent and uh, pretty much across the board, every company has to do something or the other, depending on where they have the business. The second in that chain, based on the life cycle, is actually the data management and automation. Because as they start reporting, they actually face the challenge of this complexity interacting with you know, various different sources. How do you actually get the data from all these sources in, a, in, a, in an interoperable way? How can I make the meaning out of that and actually combine those data points to actually make a meaningful report? Uh, at the same time, when it go, goes to scope three, which is supply chain, there is another big animal in itself. So data management and that automation becomes a second priority. And the third, which is actually the highest maturity amongst the customers that we see, is identifying the opportunities to take some action. So that's where uh, essentially you take action to reduce the carbon footprint. Uh, not many we see you know, venturing into that uh, you know, right away, but that is going to be the determinant of you know, who, who is going to lead and who is going to lag behind. So that is in one dimension. The second dimension is based on um, you know of the um, areas of focus. So I think uh, Ravi mentioned about sustainable product. Uh, we have a little bit different approach. Um, so what we see is that there are four primary focus areas on which sustainability initiatives are being taken up by our customers. Um, so absolutely, sustainable product is is one dimension. The second we see is sustainable IT. I mean, the case in point that, you know, everybody knows that one Bitcoin mining pretty much is like, you know, 50 um, house in in Houston, Texas that can be powered for, 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 for one day. So that is the type of energy. And then we talk about the data center and with the AI, advent of AI, it is, com you know, compute, compute power and hence the energy usage and energy requirement is going to actually, you know, skyrocket. So sustainable IT is the second dimension. Third is sustainable um, finance. So it's very specific for banking, finance, and investment banking companies where the directive, you know, how they actually finance their portfolios, their, their investments for different projects actually comes under the regulation. And also it actually puts a, a huge risk for the, for the companies. So, so that, that is a very specific segment on which sustainability is actually kicking in in a big way. Fourth, but which actually cuts across all of this is the sustainable operations slash net zero transformation. So those are the four buckets, I would say that, you know, we see uh, pretty much everything in, 
in sustainability, you can bucket under these four categories, and those are actually kicking in. Now, you talked about the, your second question was the challenges. I think I, I pointed to you know data management, getting the data, data ingestion, and uh, the, the entire lifecycle management of the data is, is probably the number one challenge at this point of time. The second is the ecosystem integration, especially when you are talking about scope three and your partners, your supply chain partners, that everything you need to actually uh, you know, get together. So, so that integration becomes uh, uh, the, the second biggest challenge. The third and um, probably the biggest one in the list is the siloed approach. There is no linkage of ROI to sustainability today. So as flying okay. yesterday from, um, from Michigan to, to Vegas, the airline I flew in um, has a commitment of 2050 for net zero uh, you know, target. Now 2050 is, we know that how many years from now, it's pretty much like 30 years. Now, um, so we can we can absolutely see you know where it will be going and and the point of the fact is that you know there is no short term approach or immediate or medium term approach because it's very difficult today to link sustainability initiatives to direct ROI which actually the street cares about. Obviously, sustainability has a value in itself, but in financial terms, that's where the clients are actually struggling today. It's very interesting, and as we go forward, we can explore more about uh, the the. The sustainability impact on on the business itself, uh, but moving on to um, uh, Badrinath, um, you know, we'll take from a macro perspective. We'll go into a micro perspective. You uh, you lead um, the uh, DigiFleet business at uh, TCS. So in that context, tell us a little more about uh, again what led to um, you know this uh, this this whole solution being created. What were some of your customer priorities that got addressed through the solution? See, you know, <clears throat> I think all great points from you know Sukant and Rajneesh and Ravi Kant, right? See, one of the uh, one of the challenges is you know you might have a vision for sustainability, right? And you might find a way to kind of convert to ROI and you might have you know, government regulations to fulfill and you know you are in a position to kind of get get some of those things and perhaps try and put an implementation strategy in place right but what happens in in ground is 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 always decoupled from what somebody in in, in the boardroom was expecting right uh, i'm not i'm not trying to undermine you know uh, uh, the the knowledge and and uh, things that the board gets right, but uh, if you look at uh, implementing, for example, you know I want to reduce carbon emission in my first mile or let's say last mile operations, right? If, if that is a broad thought process, uh, you know uh, one would follow, and they have established that yes, you know that is some that's a way we want to go forward, right? It begins to first to understand as to okay, what is my current benchmark or what is that I'm emitting to begin with, right? And then look at monitoring it and then having understood that, then tie it back to your operations. See, just because, you know, you're burning a lot of carbon in, in the first mile, you can't just stop goods moving from a plant to a warehouse, right? That, that still has to happen. And, you know, today we do not have a lot of, you know, um, uh, electric vehicles that have very long range for long hauls, right, or line haul operations, right. So, and that's where the maximum focus is, right. And and uh, you know, few of the customers that we work with, you know, have done phenomenally well in the last mile, where the uh, carbon emission is not really that great because you're talking very short distances. You've moved to EV, but then how do you look at addressing this as a challenge, and then look at smarter ways to kind of handle this, right? By changing the dynamics of your supply chain itself. We are, we, people are talking about hyper-local, you know, uh, centers being created, you know, all of those are, are coming into effect, right? But just starting with something to say, yes, I will reduce something and, and understanding and monitoring it and then be in a position to change your supply chain, right? Because of the need, this is something that is there. You can't just say, I can re replace all the vehicles and then, yeah, I'm done. So that, that is, you know, one of the uh, elements, right? And the priority is defined by that. But the challenge is, is going to be that, are, are we in a position, uh, many times, you know, we hear from the customer that, yes, I want to do this. I want to get this done. I want to go green. I want to, you know, I have a carbon net goal. 
but many a times they also fail to understand or you know think through this to say am i in a position to do the necessary changes in my operations change my process change my um value value chain dimensions itself just to meet that goal right that's that's one of the biggest places where you know uh, we, i believe you know the challenge lies so building on this point uh, i'll move to you sukant uh, see there are certain inherent uh, challenges uh, in the business processes itself so even before uh, providing a technology intervention there are processes that need to be fixed and while sustainability in initiatives are being implemented you mentioned about uh, the financial business case itself so given some of these things um, what are the offerings that you have created right where as an organization you are able to provide a more uh, holistic solution uh, to your uh, customer yeah so um, before the offering i'll also go to the structure part of it right so our offering will be very effective in the market if we have the structure and the model to nurture that uh, to strengthen that and actually you know focus on delivering client value um, probably we are um, one of the very few service providers in the world um, who have uh, created a sustainability business as a focused business um, to be to be taken to the market right because if you look at our our uh, our business today or, or the traditional si business or in, yeah, engineering services uh, business today it touches every aspect of our clients operations you know it it touches employee operations it touches uh, product operations uh, you know uh, pretty much you know every every area and many times we do work which directly or indirectly um, links to client sustainability initiatives and probably we don't uh, just you know um, consciously look at that as a sustainability initiative for example i do a logistic optimi logistics optimization for a um, retail company obviously i am reducing the you know fuel burnt and therefore reducing the carbon footprint and so on and so forth so so we have uh, you know we have actually come out with that structure which will actually cut across not just the business verticals but also the lines of business the the service lines within the organization itself which is the engineering the digital foundation digital engineering um digital application digital business so it, the business actually cuts across all this all these wings in terms of offering so as i mentioned we go to market with these four pillars so sustainable product sustainable operations sustainable it and sustainable finance for sustainable operations we have created um, an ip uh, a product uh, for the market uh, called neo net zero intelligent operations it is supported by multiple other ips and frameworks like eco sustain and twin analytics probably we can you know discuss as we go forward a little bit more in detail similarly for sustainable product uh, we have a tool called my pcm the product carbon um, footprint monitoring and design for sustainability which is basically you know based on uh, life cycle assessment and epd as well as for packaging for the product which is a, 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 a tool called packright similarly for sustainable it uh, the uh, smart dc or eco dc that we call uh, talk about which is again supported by neo and uh, also for sustainable application development and um, application optimization you know um, cloud migration and so on and so forth everything you know gets combined into that sustainable network as well under that sustainable it bucket and the fourth is sustainable finance essentially this is what we call as simplified um, esg you know analytics for finance industries and sf360 which is sustainable finance 360 so these are some some uh, you know uh, just picked from the basket of you know many offerings many use case centric offering that we have but these are the leading ips and products that we have developed um, for for the market now how we take this to market is uh, we have a um, framework called teams framework so essentially you ta target then extract act measure and sustain so target what you want to actually reduce where you want to reduce and what potential is your overarching goal for one you know year one year three year five and so on and so forth extract mm -hmm. which is essentially getting all the data from the various sources as mm -hmm. applicable and mm -hmm. analyze those data to create the insight then act on those insights to reduce your carbon footprint mm -hmm. then measure 
as well as sustain this improvement model in a continuous way. Again, it goes back to target, extract, um, act, measure, and sustain. This is a cyclic operation and it's enabled with a lot of proprietary tools and, and frameworks to help us on this journey for our customers. Very interesting, uh, Sukant. Uh, so Rajneesh, uh, from, your, from your perspective and science perspective, what are some of the offerings that you have created? How do you get involved in the life cycle of uh, sustainability interventions for customers? And maybe some examples of the kind of use cases that you've created for your customers. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I, I think, as you know, Scient is an engineering services player. So we picked up areas which are much more from an engineering perspective applicable for sustainability, right? And we are focused on uh, the, these six areas, right? So and those are the offerings that we are taking into the customers as well. The first one is uh, enabling green fuels, right? So that is about, like an example use case will be hydrogen generation, hydrogen transmission, hydrogen related uh, journey across. Uh, hydrogen refueling is an example which I'll cover later on uh, probably today. But uh, biofuels is another area, right? So various green fuels that can help reduce the carbon footprint is the first offering. And we help in terms of uh, the entire life cycle there by uh, making sure that we are able to integrate that into an ecosystem and replace some of the carbon fuel based uh, sources. The second one is on uh, electrification journey, right? Which is uh, whether it is a plant or an automotive or almost all those industries are now going through this change where they are moving towards more uh, electrification uh, in their systems, right? So we have taken up uh, that as a, a COE or center of excellence and we focus on various uh, areas there, including charging systems, motor controllers, wireless charging. One of the use cases that is probably very Exciting for us there is about urban air vehicle, uh, which is completely electrified vehicle and uh, developing a motor controller, predictive analytics, and managing that entire uh, ecosystem for an urban air vehicle. The third area is now that we are moving into more, uh, let's say, distributed energy resources or energy sources that are not consistent, they are dependent on natural sources like solar, wind, and others. There is need for increased energy storage and improved energy efficiency, depending on the time. So that's the third area where we are focused on. We are mm -hmm. developing battery systems for small automotive batteries, as well as large industrial batteries, right? So which can power an entire plant, for example, and store the energy generated during the day and provide it back during the night time, right? And another, another area is with the utilities on the grid storage, right? So that's another area where we're working on. And of course, that includes energy storage as well as energy management across the distributed energy sources. The fourth area, which is core to engineering, is on circularity in design and engineering, which includes uh, uh, making sure the product is uh, optimized for energy, making sure that uh, there is a circular practice involved in uh, waste reduction, material reuse, and all of those uh, cases, as well as ensuring that the supply chains are reoriented to reduce the uh, carbon footprint generated across the supply chain asset, right? So th that's a uh, fourth area, which we call it as circularity in design. Fifth area is uh, a little bit uh, different from this chain, but it's more about what happens if you have already generated carbon, right? And many places you cannot get rid of carbon uh, generation or carbon pollution. And there it's about carbon capture and storage so that the carbon does not go into the Atmosphere, for example, we are working with Oslo City, where there are a lot of plants in Oslo City, manufacturing plants, and they all generate carbon while the exercise is going on in terms of reducing the carbon generated or the carbon output. We are also working with the Oslo City to capture the carbon from the big emission pipes and then store it under the uh, earth, right? So in available places. So it's basically, a, I would say, more... Uh, the reactive measure in terms of uh, improving the sustainability there, carbon capture and storage. The last area is, I think, what uh, my colleague talked about earlier, uh, where we use digital technologies to improve all of this, right? So once you have an ecosystem in place, how can you have a digital twin, a digitalized view of an IoT-enabled plant, for example, to bring in advanced ana analytic artificial intelligence capabilities to have continuous improvement and also fine-tune on a real-time basis, right? So that you reduce something uh, in terms of, let's say, energy given and the output is not changing accordingly or what, whatever you need to make sure that the IoT enabled a digital twin on a real-time basis, you can fine-tune that. So that's the digital capabilities that we bring to the table as well. So six areas, green fuels, energy storage, 
and electrification, uh, circularity in design, carbon capture and storage, and finally uh, on the digitalization or digital technology side. Wonderful. That's interesting in terms of how it's it's been structured uh, from a market facing uh, context. Uh, I'll just take a quick interruption here and run a run a poll with the audience just for us to get a uh, an insight into the profile of the audience was uh, participating. Avinash, if we could uh, bring up the the poll. So what we would like to understand is, uh, you know, which uh, you know what kind of uh, organization do you represent? Uh, um, are you an engineering service provider or a GCC? If you are outside of this, you can abstain from voting. Uh, how big is uh, uh, you know sustainability? Uh, how big of a priority is sustainability in your organization? And uh, if you have already embarked on sustainability initiatives, how successful have you been? So let's take about ten seconds. Do we have the responses, uh, Avinash? All right, so we have uh, a large percentage from uh, engineering service providers, uh, followed by, um, you know, a lot of you are emphasizing the fact that sustainability is, is in fact a very high priority. Uh, in fact, this uh, is in fact, uh, you know, goes against uh, a lot of skeptics who actually say that, you know, sustainability is just a green sheen or it's 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 just the green washing that's happening. Uh, but this reiterates the fact that, you know, uh, across each of the organizations that you represent, it's 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 definitely a very high priority. And uh, you also talk about uh, uh, the the degree of success. Many of you have been successful. Some of you have been moderately successful. A large percentage, in fact, have you uh, have been moderately successful. And as we go forward with this conversation, we will try and understand what it takes to be successful um, in this journey. So thank you very much uh, for your responses. And we have one more question, uh, which is the challenges. Um, as we go through the, uh, the discussion, I would also have request you to please type in some of the challenges that you are facing in terms of enabling sustainability initiatives. So you can put that in the chat window as we progress through the conversation. And I would also request uh, the audience uh, to post any questions that they may have. We will either bring it up during the course of the conversation, uh, if aligned to the themes of the discussion that we are having, or we could uh, in fact bring it up towards the last 10 minutes of the conversation. So I encourage the audience to please post your questions. <clears throat> So let's move on to our next segment of the discussion. Um, so this is a question to you, uh, uh, Ravi Khan. Uh, we are, um, you know, uh, we did see, um, you know, the kind of offerings that service providers have uh, from a HCL standpoint, from a science standpoint. In your view, um, you know, why do you think um, an enterprise should engage an engineering service provider um, in their sustainability journey, what is the value that um, that uh, an organization, for example, a Cap Gemini, can bring in uh, to deliver on uh, the sustainability imperatives of your uh, customers? I think uh, so there are two parts. Right? So when you talk about employing, right, is BTI, right? so it's very target initiatives, or using digital technologies. What is very important is how do you realize use these methods and methodologies to industry, right? It's very important. Now, a lot of companies, right, are, are want to actually, right, they, they want to actually get into this sustainable journey. But the question is, how do we do, right? What need to be done, right? It is actually, a, it could be a factor. Now, these were, right, yeah, right, service providers or engineering R&D companies could come in and play a role to define and address those problems. So, so we, given the experience and expertise we have, and given the actually the target and goals, right, which you achieve, what is important is they can bring in a kind of a framework, right? So we can bring in a framework, a set of tools, and then given the right experience and expertise which have actually across broad range of industries, for example, uh, we have more than 11, uh, 12 uh, domains actually work upon. And each of these domains actually has a different problem statement. So one is what you have as a domain expertise. Second is 
we actually can bring in a kind of a framework, right, which can be broadly classified and adapted for sustainability initiatives. Two, three is actually what talk about actually the tools, right, enablers which you can bring in to be able to start addressing the problem. Four is actually to see how these all these right can be then used and help right uh, to the customers. So I think these these were uh, right uh, uh, we start adding a value and help the customers in in, uh, in enabling their uh, sustainable journey, uh, right? For example, when I said the framework. Right. Uh, so first, before we get into the problem, right, we need to understand what are the different steps and methodologies. What we actually call is it a five-step methodology to follow typically, right? When we get into a, uh, a problem, so first is what do you what is define the problem, right? First, identify what it is. Define uh, what are the key levers, right, which you want to address for a particular area, vertical domain, and then what is the current baseline? What are the predictors? So you need to first define. So so these are framework, right? When you have the framework, there are different aspects of it. Which will, which will be covered as a part of uh, the overall journey. Second part is what you call as an identify, what are the levers, what are the effects, right? What are the primary effects, the secondary effects? This is what you need to understand, right? As, as, as the multiple examples are quoted, but these are very important to understand. When you talk about sustainability, what is that you want to uh, address? And what are the first first level, uh, second level, uh, third level scope, or the primary effect and second, uh, secondary effect and tertiary effects, and which is the area you want to target, right? Identify the problems. And third is, collection of the right data sets, you have a huge amount of data. What is that you want to do? What is it you want to collect, right? And then calculate what are the right metrics to be used and fourth is monitor a closed loop. So what we do is we bring in this kind of a framework which are in place, right, which address each of them. Now to be able to address each of them, there are also different tools you have to build, right? It's not just, uh, uh, right, and, and those, for example, at Capgemini, we have this, what you call the carbon impact calculated tool. Now we have the GHG impact methodology processes in place, which, which tries to address these multiple uh, areas. And the other aspect is that if you want to consider, right, how do you want to get into the problems? What is that you want to do? Right? There is also a low carbon navigator kind of a tool which is uh, available and built. So the, the, this is where we start bringing a value. So we have the domain expertise, we have the framework in place, framework has set of methodologies and processes to define, and the tools to help the customer. Once you have these processes, tools, methodology experience in place, then it's a question of then start to address, right, at each of the problem statement, define what need to be done. And then start applying and then building up and uh, monitoring, right? Uh, monitor the overall thing. And it's a way anyway, the closed loop. It's, it's a long journey. It's not right uh, as, 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 as a, a short term goal, but it is easy to monitor this and then start up. We define this KPS, define this KPS, define this metric, et cetera. And, and one more thing which is important is it varies from uh, domain to domain, right? Once again, I'll take an example of wireless uh, because that, that's uh, my initial expertise area. So if you look at wireless, right, energy saving has been one of the key, key pillars, right, is one of the focus areas for all the operators around the world, right? As I said, as you get into this uh, 5G, 6G, X+, right, you're talking about 8% of the right, CO2 emissions coming from this uh, uh, operator, which is much more than other verticals, which is not really understood. So one thing you would understand is, okay, fine, right? there's a specification, the technology is also being driven in this particular case, is actually defined as a part of the specification. So you would start defining, implementing things, right, you know the metrics. Now, that is one part of it. The second part is how do you then start using them? What is the tools you apply? What is the frameworks you bring in? Can you apply certain right, uh, models uh, to be able to analyze this? So this is where the expertise area of a, of, a, of a domain, multiple verticals, bring in a process framework and methodology in place, right, which can address three set of tools which can be used to help the customers. Fourth is to be able to engage with them on the specific as action uh, for each of those use case and uh, industry segment and take it forward. So this way we see Right, uh, uh, companies, uh, any companies can help in customers in meeting their uh, uh, sustainability initiatives. Um, uh, Madrinath, um, you know, uh, it'd be great if you could share um, some context around, uh, you know, where is it that um, as a part of your solution portfolio that you are driving value to uh, the customer and also driving a differentiator? I think, you know, I'll, I'll start broad from a TCS standpoint and then perhaps dovetail it into where we specifically you know, uh, do this, right? So uh, from a TCS standpoint, you know, uh, we are looking at helping customers at, at multiple levels, right? Uh, to begin with, in terms of the, uh, the vision or the goals that are culminated against, right? So we have a framework called, you know, TCS Envira Zone, right? That kind of helps customers craft out those and then look at how they're progressing, right? At, at the strategic level, right? Uh, across the value chain. It can be right from a supplier all the way until, you know, you deliver something at the end, right? So that's the uh, 
aggregator which is powered by you know ai and ml which constantly helps customers predict what's hap- going to happen and then also course corrects course corrections as as and when required now this is coming at the most abstracted level uh, for the you know the executives and, and the board to kind of look at right now breaking that down this is now then powered by a, a an iot framework from our side which is the bringing life to things or bltt which is basically looking at helping customers connect in context predict and then run things autonomously right so this framework powering on the basis of this framework be it let's say in in, in the context of this example let's say i'm talking about a plant scenario right so we we have a connected plant solution that helps customers manage and operate the plant efficiently right and on top of it we have a, a solution called clever energy which is a product which looks at op, uh, op, uh, the operations and then helps customers understand where are they burning where are the emissions happening or where are the ghg happening and then helps them fine tune that in real time without compromising on the operations right this is around the static assets right on the connected plants and and also on the uh, clever energy element dg fleet is now focused on okay this is what is going to happen in the plant this is what is getting batched or this is what is getting produced now to do this what is the most efficient way from a asset standpoint which asset should i move what is of the asset portfolio that i have which are the ones that are providing lesser carbon emission and then pick help them pick that up and then look at optimizing the route in the most efficient way most often you know uh, algorithms are focused around um, on time delivery you know uh, most economic way of uh, you know fulfilling a particular uh, delivery we have also brought in the element of eco eco routes as well so that you know in addition to not only delivering on time and at most optimum cost you are also the impact that you leave on the environment is lesser so it basically is the culmination of all of this tying up to our framework which is bltt and then enviro zone kind of helps them with this and across the value chain it's closed loop right so there are solutions available for static assets for a lack of a better word and then mobile assets and then the enterprise itself which kind of picks it up from the framework and the solution that we have okay. i have a very interesting question uh come in which says uh, as ai computation generates massive car- carbon footprint how are we really reconciling uh, ai and uh, sustainability uh, any quick thoughts on that uh... yeah maybe i can add i mean i think that is definitely one of the biggest initiative from all the technology as well as uh, service providers is that how can you optimize the ai algorithms to use uh, least amount of compute power right so that's an ongoing exercise and i think that's continuing but uh, yeah absolutely uh, this news of more and more uh, compute uh, as well as the energy wastage happening because of ai is increasing and there is some truth to it as well so uh, there will there has to be continuous effort from all the parties to see how uh, the efficiency of ai algorithms can be improved to reduce that but i think at this stage yeah. i would say uh, it is something that is unavoidable right because ai is picking up and it's in early stages but uh, uh, it's i'm conscious of the fact that almost all the uh, service providers all all technology leaders like microsoft or others are all looking at improving and reducing that as well if i may add here um, uh, <clears throat> see let's uh, let's put uh, i think this is a great question and very um, very valid in today's context right uh, and let's put it in perspective uh, one large language model training could potentially be equivalent to the energy consumption of a city for about a month so that's the type of energy consumption that we are talking about when we talk about ai and uh, large language models and generative ai and so on and so forth now the solution uh, has to happen in the entire value chain of the ai building so ai is not just at the application or algorithm level it starts with the chip starts with the silicon so and, and then once the chip is manufactured the entire configuration of the compute and storage and how it has to be actually done so so we are talking about the silicon manufacturer the chip manufacturers the packagers like you know hp and dell and so on and so forth 
and then you are talking about the you know uh, the, the hyperscalers pro provide provisioning those uh, those compute compute assets and then you are talking about the algorithms and applications uh, developed by that so it has to happen across the life cycle in fact um, at hcl we are working on this what we call as uh, um, chip to chip to ai for sustainability so which is ex exactly you know uh, you know uh, relevant to this question working with the because we are uh, working with many of the chip manufacturers we are working with the with the sub level at the silicon level we are working ob obviously with the um, with the large uh, infrastructure players like um, DSPs and Dells of the world and hyperscalers, uh, and, and then obviously the application layer. So it's it's a complete value chain um, of AI uh, question. Uh, I think it will take time to optimize it because if you again look at the perspective that you know about 34 billion um, metric tons of carbon every year uh, that uh, we are putting to the atmosphere, and if this is the exponential rise in AI in the context that I put, potentially we are we're heading towards a doubling or tripling of that. So yes, I think it's a, it's a complete ecosystem play and there are already a lot of work happening in this to actually reduce the workload and therefore um, help on this journey. Um, <clears throat> so moving on, uh, in the last couple of segments, we spoke about uh, you know, some of your offerings and the value that uh, you're delivering to customers, but that definitely requires the right set of ingredients, the right set of capabilities, competency, uh, right? So what is it that each of your organizations, because each of you represent different organizations, uh, what is it that uh, it is doing in the context of building this uh, uh, this competency slash capability? So let's start with, uh, with you, uh, Sukant, on this. Sure. Um, so I think that's a very, um, very valid point. It's a very difficult, uh, difficult situation to put, right? For example, like, you know, sustainability, sustainability is not new. So obviously for the last 20, 30 years, uh, it is in discussion. But if you look at the massive scale it, at which it is actually going forward now, it's absolutely new. The speed and the scale is absolutely new to the industry. And therefore, um, if you look back over 30 years, do we have um, the real, you know, the scientists in the sustainability domain, the domain experts, um, and people who can actually leverage technology to have solution for sustainability? Obviously, it is a challenge. So there are many ways uh, we are trying to address that. Um, one of them is ESTEEP, uh, is our program for that we have launched. Um, where we actually co-create, it's, it's an open forum. We, you know, every year we commit to that cohort and get the startup ecosystem, our customers, as well as HCL tech, uh, you know, technology experts and the subject matter experts. They actually get into the forum to, um, you know, like a uh, innovation by design. If if I can put put that word here that they, they try to come out with, you know, the, the, the newest solution and try to learn from each other. Because today, innovation is not just confined to the four walls um, of, a, of a company. It's actually, you know, happening everywhere. So how you actually embrace and consume will, will determine, you know, how, how powerful or how, how um, you know, ahead in the, in the game you can. So that is one program. Second is Take to Sustain. This is a, this is a much higher level platform where we actually involve academia, the experts, the analysts, our customers. And uh, this is a periodic forum um, where we actually, you know, bring all these, you know, different perspectives, different, um, um, you know, stakeholders into the game to, to discuss on the emerging trends, the uh, leading technology solutions, leading solutions, and what has been, what is working, what is not working, what are the things which are actually, you know, probably sh the company should avoid. So that's another forum where we actually, you know, bring that collective intelligence to bear to 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 train our own people and actually, you know, move ahead. The third, uh, I think, we we launched a sustainability school uh, within HCL Tech, uh, addressed towards the entire two hundred twenty thousand plus, uh, you know, employees at HCL Tech. Uh, it is the, the the training. The the school is, uh, you know, it has a curriculum at different stages. Um, so like preliminary, which is basic understanding. And awareness building towards sustainability, and the second level is essentially looking at, you know, what are the typical challenges for the customers. If if this is what is going to happen, so then what is the imperative for our customers? 
The third level is so what are the typical levers and, and the solutions that potentially can help. The fourth is, you know, the emerging technologies and the research around that. So this school, so far, we have almost 45,000 hours of training, uh, which has happened. And this is evolving. This is actually as the world around sustainability is evolving. We are adding more and more content. Uh, we are getting in, um, you know, experts from outside as well as in, in addition to the, the experts from inside. So that is, I think, the, the, the one front, how we are actually training and enabling our people in, in a large scale. Uh, the second, obviously, the IP and research, um, you know, HCL uh, take, as, as all of you know, um, has a large um, uh, play in the products and platforms uh, space. So it's HCL software. So it's in our DNA, um, investing in products, platforms, and IPs, uh, not just frameworks and tools and accelerators, but also products for the market. So we have um, you know, uh, invested in and developed uh, products uh, for the market, um, such as Neo and uh, such as SF360 and MyPCM and a few others that I talked about, and also a whole array of tools and enablers. Again, it is a uh, you know bringing in all the competencies from different different wings because technology is not like a single technology that will actually be uh, you know come as a silver bullet and solve a problem. It's actually a combination of multiple competencies that actually create value. And um, third, obviously, uh, the COEs, you know, the approach towards creating uh, specific COEs around different, um, you know, use case uh, of, our, our, of our clients, you know. Like, for example, if you look at, um, uh, let's say, manufacturing industry, maybe the bigger, bigger focus is operations and, um, and uh, um, supply chain. But if I'm just, you know, switch the gear and go to engineering and construction, the smart building and green building and those become actually a major major use case. When I go to uh, utilities, it becomes smart grid and smart transmission and you know energy transition and all those things. And in oil and gas, it could be OSTs and other ESG parameters. So CO is almost twenty plus CO is uh, we have um, you know uh, very much focused on you know either on a domain or on a technology or sometimes in a combination of both. Um, so these are the three dimensions, you know, internal training and external collaboration, which is part one, part two is IPs, and third is the COEs. That's how we are actually building the talent uh, to be ready for um, future challenges. That's interesting. So Rajneesh, uh, again, from a science perspective, you did speak about uh, the focus areas that you had uh, a little while earlier. Um, and, um, you know, uh, each of it uh, requires a lot of... Um, expertise. So how are you building uh, that expertise? Yeah, so I think I agree with a lot of points that Sukandar mentioned, and uh, it's very similar. So I'll probably touch upon some of the additional elements, right? Many of these technologies, I think, uh, let me take the hydrogen example, right? The hydrogen has a lot of complex parts that needs continuous evolution, innovation, investments, right? So what we're doing is a combination of uh, two things. One is internal investments we are doing to innovate, and we have set up a center of excellence to innovate the new areas. Uh, hydrogen refueler is an example where we improved the efficiency of the hydrogen refueler to uh, reduce the time required for the refueling. But there are also about 10 different partnerships we have entered into, and they are a combination of large players uh, and small startups, right? So both of them, because there's, I think the Partnership framework is very, very important in sustainability, especially because it needs a lot of uh, R&D investments. And, and, uh, and there are a lot of startups who are co-developing or uh, creating completely new innovations there, right? So I think number one is uh, partnership. Number two is the solutions and frameworks demonstrated to customers, right? So this is an area evolving. So we have put in a lot of energy there where we are developing demonstrable use cases within science as well as with some of the startup uh, ecosystem players. Uh, and that also helps us to develop those capabilities because it needs people to be trained. And I mean, it's also kind of a university for us to develop that skill. But at the same time, it also gives proof points to our prospective customers because this is an area where everybody is very hesitant. I think if you go back to the, the poll question earlier and the third question there, the answer was, uh, that uh, are you successful a lot in this area? Answer was medium, right? And I think that's a general fact across because most of the business cases so far, we have always evaluated based on financial ROI, right? While in case of sustainability, it's not just financial ROI, but it's a bigger perspective that you have to keep in mind. While when it comes to most of the organizations, the finance 
or a ROI becomes the center stage. So how do you create the business case? How do you show the proof points, showing the bigger picture view? Uh, and also being able to develop that business case with customers is another area where we are investing uh, to have a consulting capability. We created a technology advisory team in sustainability specifically, uh, and that's a pool of uh, global uh, members, right? So it's not just in India, but we have in US, Europe, and Australia, where you can consult with customer to understand their problem, understand their regulatory requirement challenges, or understand their organizational vision requirement, and work out the next steps in terms of implementable uh, approach, right? So for each of them. So these are the three things which I think I would like to add with what Sukanta mentioned, in, include in uh, partnerships, uh, creating the proof points and demonstrable uh, uh, showcases or showpieces. And then lastly, the business case development, right? These are the areas where we are investing in developing both uh, uh, talent as well as center of excellence or IPs at this stage. That's interesting. So, um, you know, this this whole uh, discussion uh, was a follow-up to the Spotlight Awards, um, where each of your organizations uh, won an award. And in that context, uh, you know, we wanted to understand more about some of the innovations that your organization has built. And what are those initiatives that you've delivered for customers that's delivered the maximum impact, right? You spoke about impact, which is financial and something that goes beyond financial as well. So maybe with, uh, we'll start with uh, Badrinath here, uh, you know, uh, give us a little more context about uh, uh, the solution and the kind of impact uh, that it's delivered uh, to your, uh, the, the kind, the scale of impact that it's delivered uh, for your customers and what was the metrics uh, to actually uh, you know evaluate what's that uh, impact sure so you know uh, from uh, the uh, you know it, it, it goes back to our commitment as an organization to say you know we want to drive sustainable means and you know to shape up a better future right and uh, that is uh, a policy or or a belief that we have uh, which is propelling us further. And when we looked at uh, the conventional solution that we have with the G Fleet, one of the things that it, it focused extremely well and was uh, is, has been extremely successful is our ability to ingest data from moving assets. Right? And we were using this more from a maintenance standpoint to provide predictive analytics to the customers to say, okay, when a particular component of the vehicle has to be changed or when a particular tire has to be uh, replaced or rotated and all of this basis of the real-time insights that we had, right? And when the adoption of EV started going in uh, and it, it became popular and it became accessible and then there, there were all of these um, OEMs who kind of gave these phenomenal vehicles with good range and good, uh, good charging point ecosystem and other things. The customers who have conventional vehicles, uh, they're always challenged with the fact that, okay, I have, let's say, a fleet of about 10,000 vehicles. Now I want to move to electric vehicle. Uh, it, this is being done more from, uh, okay, I have so many vehicles and, you know, I will just discard them because they are old and I'll replace it with the new gen EV vehicles, right? There are, there are some thoughts that was taken in and the decisions were made in that way and where we started contributing to accelerate uh, EV adoption is, and this EV adoption does not happen overnight, right? Uh, there are a lot of things that you'll have to look at. So we used what we had and then took that information in the context and started pushing in contextual insights to the customer to say, okay, these are vehicles that are running in so many uh, directions and this is the mileage that are on the vehicle. Here is all, all the things that would happen from the uh, maintenance standpoint, you've already burned so much money on maintenance. And if you were to continue doing this, then this is what is going to happen. And then also look at carbon emission that's coming from the vehicle. It's not necessary that every old vehicle will emit a lot of carbon, right? Uh, that, that's, that's not uh, how it works. Give them that insights and say, now with this insights, here is how we, the product would recommend you to adopt EV. So you could go with this leg, so many vehicles give them recommendations to say this is how you could uh, move sequentially right and assuming that entire fleet is replaceable yes that's what it would do 
that's one part of the story the second part of the story is which i spoke briefly earlier was when you talk about uh, from a fulfillment delivery fulfillment standpoint or line haul or or the last mile connectivity part uh, historically you know we have a patented algorithm around you know providing the most effective uh, route in terms of on time delivery compliance goes right now we strengthen this as part of our roadmap to kind of in, ingest real time traffic weather information and then make that much, that much more smarter so that you know we commit to the delivery timelines on behalf of our customers who's you know uh, relying on on the product on top of it given uh, the ev vehicles we are looking at okay basis of the charge of the ev vehicles what can be deployed where it can be deployed you know if 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 the processes allow us to kind of take a detour have it charged and then get get back for the remaining deliveries that's an efficiency that we brought on top of the algorithm and obviously the fact that you know which is the most uh, you know carbon uh, low version of uh, uh, delivery is something that we have picked up and then that's what we have uh, implemented for a few customers so basis of this you know uh, you know from from a customer uh, benefit standpoint right um, we've seen at least a reduction of carbon emission in tune of about 20 to 25% right uh, the ev adoption has been uh, you know doubled over the period of time that we uh, have uh, given these insights right through which they're contributing uh, much more to their sustainability goals uh, as such right um so uh, uh, ravikan from your perspective uh, you know your your organization won the Innova, uh, innovation award how did you really uh, determine what's the right problem to solve uh, and that's a question also coming up from uh, one of our uh, audience um, so and how did you go about the whole journey itself and uh, what was the impact that you delivered to through this what uh, right um, so so there are multiple verticals focus what your the award which one is actually related to our 5G frameworks. Okay, so what we do is we have this 5G solution, which is the complete offering, and and if you are aware, right, uh, this is based on the power and based architecture, etc. Now, energy saving has been a very important theme, right, in the telecom area. As I said, right, from the specifications to actually bring in very innovative use cases, applications, application of machine learning models to able to predict the data, right, huge amount of data uh, data is generated, and see how we can optimize the total uh, power. So this, this is a trend which is happening there's a lot of study happening a lot of uh, proof points right uh, trials demos happening now there's one trend which is happening is how do you build these applications what kind of data you do and what is the models which you can build and then how do you control back and there are multiple themes you can control right across different nodes and, and if you look at a typical network the ran the radio access network consumes about 70 percent of the overall energy so it's a huge uh, energy consuming uh, node i would say compared, compared to the overall network compared to all other nodes right so so what we have done is we broke it into two parts, right? So what are the typical deployments? Now we say when we talk about ORAN, it's actually futuristic now, right? And then there are a lot of things which are happening. Fine, there could be some uh, right applications, uh, application of the data, machine, machine learning coming in. But what about the legacy nodes, right? There are a lot of legacy nodes that are available where you don't have this actually kind of interfaces available, right? They're built on actually custom hardware, right? It's not based on open hardware as well as the cards hardware as well. But try to problem into two statements, right? One is we try to see how do you, what are the techniques we can actually solve Right within the context of a RAN itself, right? And what are the techniques you can apply? What are the levers which you can have in the software, right? What is the intelligence you can in software uh, to be able to control right this energy? So that's one theme. The second theme is what are the nodes data which can be exposed outside the right the RAN? And then once you have this other interfaces available, external uh, standard is uh, open interface available, you have these nodes to up that and then you can apply the data point. So we address this in two problems. So one is what is actually called as open interface model in the application of the machine learning are equal in models, methodologies, and be able to address back, right, controlling the energy saving of the RAN. Two, what you call as it is self, right, a learning RAN in itself to see, I don't, I may not have actually luxury to run machine learning models, but still, what do I need to do within the context of the RAN itself, right, to be able to apply some techniques. So that's another problem set which I to address. Uh, to be able to help customers in trying to uh, right to them. So what the key problems are is what are the levers, what are the technologies, what are the methodologies, which all nodes should apply. So there's a lot of intelligence can be done. Now, once again, right, you can talk about machine learning as a model process, etc. But with the amount of there's a lot of data within the node itself, and this kind of a self-learning 
no uh, uh, people to control is, is, is one thing which uh, actually uh, built as a part of what's called intel iran right that's what we call it so it's actually iran is intelligent itself to be able to take some decisions based on the available data and not in addition right if you have these external monitor forces available which can also be uh, set across so these are the two kind of uh, aspects which, which are provided as a part of a reference for customers who then use them to build their uh, overall products in, uh, in the product journey so moving on to Sukant, uh, just zooming out a bit, right? Um, you know, we've had these discussions on business case, the financial impact, et cetera. So in the context of the innovations that you've delivered or engagements that you've delivered for your customers, what has been those metrics um, that uh, you've tracked for yourself and for the customer? And typically, just, just to add a little more context, um, you know, there is the leading and the lagging metrics. And I would believe that there is more the lagging metrics in the case of uh, sustainability because it takes a while to realize the kind of benefits uh, that could be achieved through sustainability. So uh, help us, uh, you know, probably uh, throw some more light in terms of what, what would be those ideal metrics? Um, again, you could take your in engagements initiatives as a case in point, or you could talk about it from a broader sense. Yeah. So I think um, I think when you mentioned business impact, right? So uh, and in the context of the Spotlight Award and where the new uh, as a product that we had mentioned, um, business impact actually is at the center of this uh, product innovation. Um, in fact, in addition to Spotlight Award, uh, within twelve months it got three awards, including IoT Product of the Year Award as well as Sustainability Product of the Year. So. Um, and this is completely driven by the business impact. And the biggest problem we wanted to solve, and which um, I was alluding to in the beginning, uh, one of the challenges that companies face is, yes, I can get the data, I can report, and uh, you know probably I'll comply. But then what is in it for me in short and medium term? Yes, obviously, we are doing many of these things uh, to a common goal. Uh, you know, restricting the world's uh, you know temperature to rise. You know, as per the Paris Accord, maybe you know restricting within two degrees centigrade and all those things. Every everybody knows that, but linking it to the ROI is a challenge. So this product, this innovation that we um, ideated upon and we delved into developing is basically how you not only just report and uh, you know monitor, but how how do you actually predict? How do you actually? How can you, uh, you 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 build even KPP around your sustainability? Like say, for example, I want to reduce my carbon footprint by ten percent this year. So how as a uh, as a CSO, the chief sustainability officer, or maybe a plant in charge, how do I know that you know whether this quarter I am actually on track, this month I am on track? How much I will actually add in next two quarters, three quarters? So this is a uh, digital twin enabled. Um, solution, um, innovation, uh, which actually gets the data in real time, also combines that data from different other systems to make meaningful insights based on the you know carbon footprint calculator and the algorithm running at the back end and so on. But that's not just it, because if I run a uh, run an operation and a global company, every company today is a global company, right? so they would have operations in different countries, different locations, different business. So you can only act at the level of where, where the action happens, where, where, where the problem happens. And those problem at the source of the problem usually would be an asset, a family of assets, or could be a source of energy consumption, which is material in nature. So how do you actually get that data and decide that whether it is good, bad, or ugly? And you can only do that if you normalize the data. And how normalization works, that you know my X equipment in plant A operating in US would be very different from my equipment operating in maybe Mexico or maybe in China because the environmental condition is also different. So it takes a whole lot of external variables to normalize. It even takes the engineering uh, recommended um, you know, uh, data points for the operating parameters and so on and so forth and creates a normalized view to give you real actionable insight as to where you can do. So you can, it can, you can compare asset by asset, you can compare uh, line by line, you can compare plan to plan, you can compare building to building, you can compare zone within a zone to a second zone, and you can have you know all this type of this thing. And then it actually predicts 
that you know based on this conception based on this uh, whatever is happening this is where you uh, you will end so it actually helps the decision maker to build kpps and therefore manage those kpps in a proactive way so uh, because and obviously after that it takes it is compliant for all the standard regulations it can produce your reports and all those things that is given so you know i, I don't want to take time in explaining that so it, it gives you that power and it, in, in fact, recently, uh, we added to that the recommendation engine, which is actually generative AI-based recommendation engine. So it, you can actually interact with the tool that you know, it could tell you that, um, you know, what needs to happen, where, where you actually need to uh, need to, to uh, take an action. So that is in the energy energy reduction. In fact, um, one of the companies, the chemical companies, 97 facilities, we implemented this. And uh, without energy transition, without going to sustainable energy uh, you know source uh, you know transition which is their next step uh, based on just the identification prediction and stuff it has reduced uh, almost 15% energy uh, consumption uh, keeping the you know keeping at the normalized view of the same output and same production and so on and so forth you can basically interpret it as a 15% cost reduction in energy energy consumption that is the type of impact when you, when we talk about business impact that's where it starts and uh, if, if you if you look at it, I mean, our message to the market is pretty much sustainability is not a burden. It is not a cost center. It is actually a big opportunity. Because at the end of the day, what you are trying to do, you are reducing the energy consumption. You are uh, essentially reducing the weight of the product. You are enhancing the life cycle of the product when it comes to sustainable product and, and things like that. Uh, and and by by every means you are actually impacting the bottom line and obviously on the top line if you are you know focusing on sustainable product you have a loyal customer base and, and more uh, affinity to actually buy your product and so even there is a top line impact as well so this solution the innovation is essentially uh, focused on the business impact and everything else is periphery it's a digital twin enabled um, ai enabled um, you know product and that was the genesis on which we actually invested in, into that because we felt there is a big gap in the market because everybody focuses on creating a tool that can actually report. Uh, but we wanted to, you know, report is just the baseline. That's not where the value is created. Yeah. Uh, Rajneesh, uh, maybe thoughts uh, uh, from you in terms of the innovation that won the award. Uh, and if you could do it a, a little quickly. Uh... Yeah, sure. Thanks, Akarin. I think there were two uh, innovations that I wanted to talk about that uh, was, we were proud to get the award. The first one is on the engine optimization. It falls into the engine, the design optimization and the uh, circularity part that we talked about in my uh, earlier part. We were able to deliver 22% of the effort uh, that was overall done in that engine to improve the efficiency. And uh, in terms of impact, it created about 3,100,000 tons of carbon reduction every year uh, from that engine, right? So the engine is used by the aeroplanes across the world. And uh, the, the new engine that developed versus the old engine improved the efficiency of operations as well as the carbon production, uh, reduced carbon production, right? So from that engine, right? So that is a significant improvement. It's about 16% uh, less fuel burn that was uh, done for this uh, particular new engine. And we were, uh, part of this uh, 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 solution development, there were about 20 IPs developed. So it was a significant innovation effort from both signed as well as our customer partner in this case. The second innovation was about hydrogen refueler, right? So one of the biggest challenges in hydrogen is uh, refueling takes a lot of time. And uh, in the shipping industry that we were working on, as well as some of the other industries, there was a need to reduce the time required for uh, hydrogen refueling. This solution reduced the, uh, the refueling time significantly, right? And uh, also, we what we did after that is redesign this so that it's not just for big ships, but also for smaller uh, uh, equipments, right? So smaller marine vehicles, so that it can be transported from one place to another for faster refueling as well, right? So both of these were, were very proud uh, achievements in the sustainability space for Scient, and uh, we were lucky to get the award from the NASCO on this year. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone. I think it was uh, really interesting to know and understand more about uh, these innovations. And it's really a testimony to the capability of um, Indian ERD as well as uh, the service provider community. Uh, 
so I would like to uh, wrap up this conversation wherein, you know, where I want to quickly, uh, in about 30 to 45 seconds, uh, get your perspectives on, you know, are we just scratching the surface in terms of the opportunities that we are addressing today as a part of sustainability? And how do you see um, the role of the service providers and the Indian ERD evolving? So maybe we'll start with uh, you, Sukhan, 30 to 45 seconds. We'll quickly try and wrap it up. Sure. Um, so I think uh, your first point, are we scratching the surface? The answer is yes. And we need to be very blunt about it. The answer is yes, because uh, uh, we know where we stand. We, we know where the globe, uh, you know, the, the collectively, uh, uh, you know, uh, the globe stands today. Uh, and we know what, how much we have to cover. Uh, when it comes to the role of um, Indian e and sector, I think uh, it, it plays a very, very vital role. Uh, I mean, today almost twenty, more than twenty percent of, of uh, engineering work, the global, you know, global engineering work actually happens um, or are supported by Indian e e e and sector, right? And uh, we have more than five thousand um, startups uh, focused on sustainability in India today. Is a massive, massive increase, uh, you know, uh, how this startup ecosystem actually actually evolved. So I think we have a very big role to play because we touch the, you know, the all the nerve systems of our customers, the entire industry base across industry verticals, where um, this is actually happening and where um, the leverage is and where the impact can be created. So. Um, so I think I think it's a it's a it's a way forward for us and the right direction I mean, and uh, looking at uh, what what we just discussed today and all the colleagues uh, all the all the all the uh, the co participants uh, what they mentioned I think um, we are on the right path and we can play a very big role. Perfect, uh, Rajnish. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I think I look at it from two perspectives. While I agree with uh, all the comments uh, mentioned by Sukhan, I think we, there is also this element of uh, the need in, in the India itself, right? Uh, which is uh, a lot of promise, a lot of need to evolve into a uh, sustainable uh, economy for India. So there is a lot of need in terms of, uh, I think we have a lot of uh, challenges that we need to address internally, and that means a lot of innovation. And uh, from where we are right now, that's a great place to be in terms of developing that for India. And we are way ahead, right? So we just launched the, the hydrogen uh, solution in uh, Delhi very recently, right? As a country, we have a lot of electrification that's already happening. I think one of the uh, areas where significant EV sale is happening is in India. So I think the innovation and the ecosystem is right, rightly placed for India to develop that as an indigenous capability. Because many of the places earlier, we were trying to follow uh, the what, what was happening in other countries, right? But now we have an opportunity to lead this from the front, make sure whatever we are developing is implemented in India and we can be way ahead of the other uh, countries. Of course, there are pockets where there are significant improvements also happening. But if you take the economy or the world as in general, I think there is a lot to be done and India is definitely in one of the uh, forefront uh, runners in that area right now, whether it is electrification, hydrogen, carbon related uh, uh, biofuels, right, for that matter, et cetera, et cetera. So I think engineering ecosystem or ERD ecosystem can develop that as an innovation ecosystem for India and then take it to market, like something like made in India, but for the world. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, Ravikant. No, absolutely, right. As Sukhana mentioned, it's actually just a as a starting point is a huge, huge potential which you see, right? And, and Indian uh, R&D companies actually uh, do have a very, very important role. So bring in innovation, right? And then we have that experience and expertise and capabilities. And then bring in these models, frameworks, and tools to enable the customers. So we think that's a, a huge potential opportunity which can be leveraged, right? And definitely in this particular uh, area. Uh, final thoughts from you, uh, Adri, as we wrap up this uh, discussion. Yeah, I couldn't really agree more from uh, all the other, you know, co-participants here. Uh, uh, the way I would summarize it, you know, uh, India has always been known uh, as a land of engineers globally. Uh, our designs, our reputations have uh, been par excellence. So it's, uh, it is, uh, we see this growing and uh, we see us being called as sustainability champions across the globe, right? So the ecosystem is right. And there are a lot of things that have been put in place. So yeah, 
time to become sustainability champion and lead the change from the front and contribute for a better world. It was great to hear each one of you share your insights uh, on sustainability. And yes, truly, it is the next uh, frontier for uh, Indian ERD. Thank you for your time today. Uh, thanks for those wonderful insights. Thank you to the audience. Uh, thanks for your questions. We couldn't get through all the questions because of paucity of time. But I hope uh, all of you um, um, enjoyed the session and found it uh, informative. So thank you very much for participating again.